Bonjour, bienvenue. Bienvenue ici à mon talk about uh, Galvian. Um, as you might have noticed, I'm not a French speaker, not native, not even close to native, so please excuse me if I continue in English. Uh, today I want to talk with you about uh, GraalVM and how you can build your own DSL with GraalVM. Before we get started, we need to dive into domain-specific languages. Um, but just have an idea of, of what you already know about GraalVM. Who has already done something with GraalVM? Can you please show me hands? One or two? One face I didn't expect at all. <laughs> what have you done with it? Have you been doing like uh, native executables, for example? Who has done that? Great. Uh, running uh, other languages than, than Java, say uh, JavaScript or Ruby. Okay. Well, today we're going to do neither of that. So I hope you'll learn something new. Domain-specific languages. So what are domain-specific languages? Domain-specific languages are languages which are uh, meant to be uh, run by a computer, but uh, are focused on a certain domain. Often it's a business domain, but not always. Let's look at an example. I think this is a very similar example. Many people will recognize this immediately. What's the domain for this language? What is it targeted at? Databases. Interacting with databases, getting data from it, modifying data inside it. OK, excellent. Another example. What is the domain of this language? Testing, excellent. I was hoping for someone to say it's about financial transaction processing. But it's not. It's about testing. It's about describing what a system does, how, what you expect it to do given certain preconditions and certain actions. OK, um, another example, a bit more far-fetched. You know the story about the, the goat and the wolf, and they try to transport cabbages, right? It's a very difficult problem, so they invented their own language where they were able to run simulations. What if we first moved the, the goat to the other side? What if we first moved the coal to the, uh, the other side? Um, this is actually a working example. It runs, uh, it's, it's written in, in Scala, and it has all kinds of, of, of syntactic sugar going on to make it a valid Scala code, but also language that the, the wolf and the goat could actually understand and write themselves without having to hire programmers to solve their business problem. You can check it out on GitHub. It's, it's pretty cool. That's, well, at least it works. But um, one final example for today. Um, this language. Is it familiar to anyone in the room? Oh, quite a lot of people, actually. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, this, this is not really a domain-specific language, um, although you could say the domain is um, impressing your friends and colleagues or maybe uh, making your brain explode. The language is called BrainFuck. Um, the form that we just saw, so this form, is the, the preferred way of writing, as they say, uh, because it makes you look even more like a genius, if you can really understand this. Um, the same program, but now annotated with commands, uh, uh, comments, um, makes it a little bit easier to understand. The program will add two numbers, two and five, and print the results to standard out. Um, uh, if, if you really want to dive into it, it it's annotated. Um, everything which is not a, comment, uh, a, a, a construct in the language is automatically a comment. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why there's nothing like slash slash or, or something like that. Um, but that's also why uh, comments don't end with a uh, dot and why there's no commas inside the sentences, because, the, because that's something from the language, so it would get evaluated. Um, the language has a very simple uh, memory model. It's just a 30,000 uh, slot uh, uh, array uh, which can store bytes. And each byte can be uh, it's initially zero, and you can uh, increase or decrease the value of a byte uh, one step at a time. And there's one pointer, so as to say, which just says, OK, this is the current location we're looking at. We're now at the second uh, item in the memory model, which has the value 5. Um, and by using the commands, you can uh, modify the memory and do all kinds of things. For example, there's a command to increase the value in the, at the current location and also want to decrease. There's one to print the current value to standard out and want to decrease, uh, uh, to, to read one byte from standard input. Um, there's um, conditionals, so we can jump back and forth inside our source code based on the current value 
uh, of the, uh, the, the, the location we're looking at. Um, and finally, we can move the point pointer left and right inside the memory model. Typically, the memory is about 30,000 uh, bytes, as I said, but, well, there's no formal specification, and some implementations have smaller or bigger memory sizes. So, that's about domain-specific languages uh, for this moment. Um, in the remainder of the talk, we'll use this brain fog as an example of a DSL, not because it is a DSL, but because it's a relatively easy language to implement, that is, not to write a program yourself. Although, you can write any program in BrainFuck. It is proven to be um, a Turing complete, which means any algorithm can be implemented in BrainFuck. You didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Uh, the other thing is, it's a Turing tarpit, which means, yes, you can implement any language, uh, any algorithm in this language, but it's probably not a good idea to do so. You'll probably lose your head if you try to. But, well, you can, if you really want to. The other thing this talk is about is about GraalVM. GraalVM, as you might know, is a research project from Oracle Labs and the University of Linz in Austria, um, which, is, uh, which has a very uh, modest goal, one VM to rule them all. So if we have one virtual machine where we can run all sorts of program on, we would be done. Why is that? Because the observation from the researchers is that many language uh, implementations suffer a bit from the fact that they need to have a performant runtime. They need to have good tools. They need to have compilers, uh, just-in-time compilers, uh, machine compilers, all kinds of stuff, and they're basically doing a lot of things the same time all over and over again. And as long as your brand new shiny language doesn't have this performant runtime and good tooling support, um, it will probably not be a big success because people are like, oh, yeah, it's a shiny new language, but I can't even debug it. Or, yeah, it runs, but it's terribly slow. Uh, and, and what the researchers aim at is, is make it easier uh, for new language implementers to, um, to, to, to have a, a platform where they can run their new language on. And one of those languages could be BrainFuck. Let's look at a small example. This is a Spring Boot application. Um, it just runs on Java, because Spring Boot runs on Java. You can actually see that. Um, it says there in the footer. It runs on Java 1.8 um, with OpenJDK Graal VM Community Edition 1900. Should be 1902, by the way, but never mind, uh, because I just upgraded over the last day. That's a good thing, right? Upgrading just before your demos. Usually works quite well. So, as I said, Spring Boot application, nothing special there, uh, a simple web interface. I can just copy paste my program in it, and I can ask uh, to run it. And it will say, well, the outcome is seven. We all knew that already because two plus five is seven. It tells me how long it took, which is completely irrelevant, but at least it's something. Uh, and that's all. This is not per se rocket science in the sense that, hey, well, you could have written this without GraalVM, right? The language itself isn't that hard to implement, it's just eight commands, a very simple memory model. But it shows that, yes, you can um, add new language capabilities to GraalVM. Out of the box, GraalVM is actually a, an umbrella of projects. Um, of course, we have the, the Java Virtual Machine uh, with a JVM compiler interface, and by default, you get the hotspot uh, compiler. Um, but GraalVM comes with its own compiler, the GraalVM compiler which is inside your JVM. You get an, another Java virtual machine, um, and it has a different compiler. It behaves differently. It does different things. You can run Java on that out of the box, of course, because it's a Java virtual machine, after all. But if you use Truffle, and we'll dive into what Truffle is, you can run other languages as well. You can run Ruby or JavaScript, for example. And there's tons of tutorials on the internet that show you how you can do that. It runs in the JVM. It runs on the very same compiler as your Java code does. And that's what the amazing thing is about GraalVM. You're not implementing a language in Java. You're implementing a language in such a way that it runs on the same compiler as Java, but it outputs the, the, the same highly optimized code as your Java code would. And that's completely different. 
This is actually state-of-the-art uh, uh, academic research. You, if, if you're diving into this and how it actually works, you, have, you need to read academic papers. It's been a long time since I did that, but it was actually fun to do that. Um, this, this is, well, pretty, pretty state-of-the-art stuff. As I said, there's the GraalVM compiler, and you can use that to run your source code on. You can run uh, any Truffle-based language without the GraalVM compiler, and it will still work. It will just run slower. At least that's what they say. So I thought, let's make a small benchmark. There's a uh, program on the interweb which is called japi.bf. It's yet another pi calculator, um, and it calculates the number pi. Well, at least that's calculation intensive, so that makes up for a good benchmark, right? If, I if you run that on the, on the Java hotspot 64-bit uh, VM, and you ask it to calculate 15 digits of pi, uh, you'll get, on average, uh, 0.53 seconds for each time you call it. Pretty fast, right? And there's a mean error of one thousandth of a second. Not bad. If you run it on the ground VM, it runs significantly faster, 0.045. That's about 10, 15 percent faster. Pretty cool. Maybe the, the complexity of the program does matter, so let's increase the program a bit and ask it to calculate 45 digits of pi. Who knows them by heart? Ah, oh, that's such a disappointment. Oh, neither do I. As you can see, the, uh, the hotspot uh, VM uh, takes about .2, uh, 0 0.2 seconds for each invocation of the program. Uh, and the, the GraalVM based uh, runtime takes about 0 0.80 seconds for each invocation. So still, it's about 10 to 15 percent faster. We'll see later on why that is, but the claim from Oracle, it should run faster if you have the GraalVM compiler. Well, it's it might it might indeed be true. Of course, this is a very small benchmark. It's just one program. It's just my MacBook, and it was probably doing other things at the same time, at the same time as well. But still, there is a, a difference that we can measure. So I've mentioned the name Truffle already a few times. What is Truffle? Truffle comes with GraalVM, and it's a, a an open source library that you can use to, to build your own language implementations. Your own language implementation um, by building an abstract syntax tree and we'll see what it is in a, in a few minutes, and telling Truffle how to interpret that. And Truffle does a few magic things in order to make that a performant implementation. An abstract syntax tree um, is basically a, a, a hierarchical structure, a tree-like structure, which describes how your program looks like to a machine. So it typically has one root node, um, and in this example we see that there's a bunch of nodes that correspond with the specific um, uh, commands that uh, our language knows. So there's a, a node for increasing the value in the current pointer. Uh, there's one for uh, jumping to the corresponding bracket. There's one for increasing the pointer, so moving it uh, that direction right or, or back. Um, and if you uh, want to run any program, uh, almost all runtimes will, will at some point in time have an abstract syntax tree which describes uh, what the program is about to do. Why is it called abstract? It's abstract because uh, all kinds of details that are typically in your source code aren't there yet. So did we use brackets in our if statement? The abstract syntax tree doesn't know. Uh, did we use uh, indentation? The abstract syntax tree doesn't know. It's abstract in the sense that it just describes what your program is about to do. And Truffle allows us to build an abstract syntax tree, so a tree-like structure of uh, plain old Java objects, and annotate them using Truffle so that we uh, tell Truffle how to run the program. And what Truffle will do is it will start with interpreted, uh, the interpreter entry. Truffle is especially good for uh, dynamically typed languages. And uh, they typically start with an interpreter entry. And there will be a bunch of uh, nodes in the abstract syntax tree that are run in the interpreted mode. 
And at some point in time, Truffle may decide, well, uh, let's move to runtime code. This is basically the code that lives in the uh, Java platform itself, because Truffle builds on top of the JVM. It may also decide, wow, this is a very important code. Let's compile that to machine code already and run that. Uh, for different functions, it may pr produce different subtrees of uh, highly compact, highly optimized uh, uh, machine code. And as you can see from the arrows, a truffle will dyna dynamically jump back and forth between those different modes. And why does it do that? Um, it do does that because uh, there may be assumptions uh, based on which the compiled code is generated. Compiled code may have assumptions on the type of data, uh, on the values of the data, and uh, Truffle uses those assumptions to create highly optimized code. This is part of a process which is called partial evaluation. Partial evaluation is something that you might have uh, learned in maths already. Let's have a very look at a very simple program which calculates x to the power of n. Um, x to the power of n, when n is 0, x to the power of 0 is always 1. So that's the first rule that's written down uh, up there. Then if n is even, we can take half of n, re-invoke our program with uh, x and half of n, and multiply that with its own outcome. That's a basic mathematical rule. I hope this is not new for you. Um, and finally, if n is not even but odd, we can invoke our same program with n lowered by 1, and we can multiply that with just x itself. Now, partial evaluation says, let's just assume that n is 5. Now, our program becomes so much simpler, because we can just say, oh, well, in that case, um, our program is x multiplied with x, uh, multiplied with itself, multiplied with itself. The program is simpler because of an assumption that we made. And Truffle does this same thing with your program logic and your data types and your data structures. It assumes that, well, this variable in a dynamically typed environment, remember, remember uh, this will probably be an integer. So let's just compile it to machine code, assuming that it's an integer. And if that assumption fails, we can jump back to interpreted mode and run it there and see what happens. But if our assumption is true, and it was indeed at runtime uh, an integer value, we have run the compiled code, the machine code, which was so very efficient and so very compact. There's two things that we need to know if we want to make use of this powerful feature of uh, Truffle. The first thing is boundaries. Imagine if there were no boundaries, okay? We're in Europe, we're pretty much used to that. We can travel wherever we want, but that also means we can travel a long distance and maybe we can travel further than we should. Same holds for partial evaluation. If I start with my program, I can walk the whole path of everything that my program does, including platform code from, from, from the Java virtual machine. And I'll, I'll probably be evaluating uh, calls to system out print line. Well, does it make sense to optimize those? Probably not. The, 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 the JVM code is already very efficient in doing that. With boundaries, I can say to Truffle, OK, I know you're going to do this partial evaluation, but here you can stop. Please, don't go there. Don't do your partial evaluation here. This part of the code is so much optimized, it doesn't make sense. Or it's so complex that it doesn't make sense. Or it's so seldomly used that it doesn't make sense. There can be many reasons for that, but it's a way to tell Truffle, please stop here. And the, the effect is that your, your uh, your machine code gets smaller because, well, maybe not all paths are in there. But that's okay because, as I said, Truffle can just jump back to interpreted mode and try again. So boundaries, very important to keep the machine code compact and uh, efficient. And the second thing, oh yes, that's, this is how you, show, how you show Truffle how to do that. You put an annotation on it. You say, this is a Truffle boundary, and this is actually... Uh, uh, around a call to a system out print line, I don't want you to optimize this at all. Just use the platform code for that. Second thing we need to know about is specializations. 
And this is also a very powerful feature. As I said, uh, Truffle will do all kinds of um, expectations, assumptions, on your data types. So for example, um, imagine we have a part of our abstract syntax tree which does a division. Well, we all know we can't divide by zero. Um, the, the, the most efficient way to implement it is just uh, return a slash b. But this will not work if b is zero. So we can put a specialization around this part of the AST, and we can say this is the most efficient implementation given that b is unequal to zero. This also means that you will need to provide another implementation, another specialization, basically, for the situation where b is zero. It can be anything. It, can, it will probably be some kind of an error being thrown or something, but you, you need to have more than one specialization, of course. So let's look at an example of that. Um, imagine we have addition, and we have two integer values. That's the assumption we do. This addition is only used for integer values. Given that the two integer values added up together are within the possible values of an integer, we can have an efficient implementation, which will just add a to b. But there might be cases where a plus b is more than fits inside an integer. And we need to have a, an, a, another version for that. What should we do then? Well, we should probably put it in a long should return along in that case. Um, and as you can see, in this case, we don't have a guard that says a plus b bigger than int max value. We just let the original implementation follow. We use mav add exact, which will throw an arithmetic exception if the resulting value is too big. And if that happens, Truffle will go to another specialization, in this case, our do add with overflow, which allows for these very big values to be returned. So what we see in the first uh, invocation is that the result does fit inside an integer, and we use our uh, do, add with over, do add no overflow implementation. It will return an int, and noth nothing goes wrong there. In our second invocation, we have integer.max value, and we add the number one. This doesn't fit inside an integer anymore math.addExact will throw an arithmetic exception. Truffle will catch that. And we'll see, oh, well, there's another specialization. Um, and, well, this arithmetic exception is an, is an indication that I should actually rewrite my uh, implementation. Well, let's take this other implementation that lives down there. Oh, it will return along. And it will uh, invoke that. And it will be fine. And then the first time, Integer max value minus one plus one should still fit inside an integer, right? Still, Truffle will say, I'll do no add with overflow, because last time, this was the most efficient implementation. This may not be the most efficient implementation at this time, but we don't know yet. We still need to figure that out. As I said, GraalVM uh, claims to be faster than a stock JVM, uh, and we saw a, a, small, a few small benchmarks uh, that seems to prove that. Uh, why is that? Well, one of the things you can do inside your AST, except for uh, boundaries and specialization, is that you can also manually transfer uh, execution mode back to the interpreter. It's called the uh, transfer to interpreter and invalidate call. And if you invoke that method, Truffle will know that, well, whatever we were doing right now is um, under some kind of an assumption that it's no longer valid, so we invalidate that, and we transfer execution mode back to the interpreter. Now, if I do this on a stock JVM, a normal JVM, it says, well, that's a function call. Great. But I still need to do return i smaller than zero uh, minus i else do i. Just return i. I still need to do that, says the stock JVM. But the GraalVM compiler knows, hey, transfer to interpreter and invalidate. I know that one. That means that I'm not going to do the, the last line because I'll never get there. Remember, I get back to interpreted mode, and hey, that last line is not reachable. So it will just remove that from the, from the machine code. Um, 
This leads to smaller code, leads to more efficient code, uh, and that's why that's one of the reasons why having the Graal VM compiler present at runtime uh, can can make a performance increase. So, uh, as we've already seen quite a lot, uh, we've seen that we uh, somehow need to get into an, an abstract syntax tree, uh, which we can uh, annotate with all kinds of truffle uh, annotations, so that we tell truffle uh, how to use our AST. But how do we get to an AST? Well, the typical path there is uh, uh, something that you often see in compilers. If you've ever written a compiler, it will be probably very familiar to you. I never wrote a compiler myself, so I had to figure that out. Imagine we have a bunch of source code, just a, a, a very small expression, two numbers with a minus sign in between. To each and every one of you, this is probably very familiar. Oh, it's just a, an expression that will subtract uh, one number from the other number. But in source code, these are bytes. And these bytes can be interpreted as ASCII or UTF uh, code set. Um, and then they appear to be numbers. But, and, and a minus sign, by the way. But uh, that, that's just all, right? That, that's what source code is. It's just a text file on your machine. It, it's not yet executable. The first thing we need to do is we need to have a lecture. A lecture takes the bytes that appear to be uh, uh, ASCII characters, for example, and it assigns meaning to parts of that. So it says, well, the first three characters, those are all numeric values. This is probably a, a number. And then there is a, a, a hyphen. That's, oh, that's a minus sign. It, 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 gets, it gets meaning. It gets semantics. And then there's, again, three, three characters that appear to be a number. So we had a bunch of characters which had no meaning except for the characters themselves, and we convert it into a sequence of tokens. Tokens are the same, they can be visualized in the very same way, but now they have meaning, they have semantics added to it. They, they mean something to the next component that we'll build, which is the parser. And the parser says, okay, I have a bunch of tokens, recognizable elements from the language that I'm working with, let's convert that into a data structure. And this is typically a hierarchical data structure, but uh, parsing doesn't necessarily lead to a hierarchical data structure. It does when you are parsing uh, programs, but you can have parsers for other data structures, and then it's not necessarily hierarchical. And in this case, it will lead to a, a very small hierarchical data structure which says, okay, the whole thing appears to be uh, an expression, the expression consists of one subtract operation, and there's two operands. One is a number 734, one's a number 692. How many of you have in the meantime been calculating what the outcome is? Oh, that's, I would have expected at least someone to yell at 42. Of course it's 42. But never mind. So th these are the basic steps that we need to follow to, to have our source code, plain text, converted into an abstraction text tree. Now, if you're like me, uh, you're like, oh, um, I can do this. This is basically regular expression. It's a bit of pattern matching, right? I mean, there's eight com commands. How hard can it be? And if your language is so small, yes, you might get away with that. If your language is more complex, yeah you'll probably have one additional problem. I think we all know this, right? You think regular expressions are a good solution to whatever problem you have at hand, you start using regular expressions, and suddenly you have even more problems than you had before. If your language is more complex than that, you're probably better off using a parser generator like Antler, for example, which is a tool that will generate a parser from a formal description of what your language looks like. For my example here, with BrainFuck, I was able to get away with just using regular expressions, and investigating Antler is on my to-do list, but well, it takes some time. Um, but if you want to go this path, probably you, you'll, you'll need to have a serious parsing tool and not try to write one yourself, because it is pretty hard. So, okay, we have, um, we have something to convert our uh, source code into an abstract syntax tree which is the lexing and the parsing. We have something to run our AST in a very efficient way, which is called GraalVM and Truffle. Now, how do we make use out of this? 
Well, Graal VM comes with the Graal VM updater, uh, or GU for short, uh, until the first um, uh, big release, which was 1900, a, f a few weeks ago. Many people didn't, uh, hadn't heard of it yet. Uh, but in 1900, they decided to, um, to, to, to take the native image tool out of the stock distribution. And then all of a sudden, people needed to know about the GU tool because you needed to install it after you had downloaded a Graal VM. It wasn't there by default anymore. Uh, and you do that, for example, with GU install native image. It will give you an additional tool in your GraalVM distribution. But you can install other components as well, such as language packs. For example, um, the component that I made for my BrainFuck implementation, I would install with GU minus capital L install BrainFuck component. The minus capital L is there because it's a local file. Otherwise, the native image tool, I mean the GU tool, would go on the internet, look for the component, probably not find it because it's not published in some central repository, uh, and it would fail. And here I'm just saying, well, the file lives here on disk. Now, what does a component look like? It's a, it's a basic jar file, which means that we have a, a meta-inf uh, folder there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a meta-inf folder, um, which has some uh, descriptive information in the manifest. Uh, default manifest, but it also has some additional fields like um, what is the identifier for this component. Then there's a folder structure down there, GRE, languages, BF, uh, which basically says, okay, uh, take the GraalVM home directory where, where, uh, where GraalVM was installed. Uh, under that is a GRE folder, under that is a language folder, under that is a BF folder, and there I want to have the following structure, a bin directory with a BF, which is just a small wrapper script that uh, will eventually invoke the BF launcher. The BF launcher is a small command line utility that I wrote just to be able to lo load a BF file from disk and uh, execute it. And then there's brainfuck.jar, of course, which is the main uh, compo the, the, the core of the component, basically, because that's where the, the lexing and the parsing happens. That's where the AST is built, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you package that all together. You can even uh, uh, tell the, the GU tool, uh, I need a specific file permissions, or I need uh, some symbolic links inside the folder structure, and you package that all together. And that's what you ship to your customers. Now, if somebody installs your component, they, of course, want to be able to run your DSL in, your, uh, in their Java programs. It's a very simple three-step process. The first step is to prepare the source code. We do that by having some kind of input. In this case, it's just a hard-coded string, but could, of course, be anything. Could be a request parameter. Could be a script that's packaged with their application. Could be read from disk, whatever. Um, and you ask the Graal uh, APIs create a source object for me that represents this piece of source code. Next thing is you need to have a polyglot context, which is a Graal uh, thingy. Um, you, you say, uh, I want to have a new context uh, with a specific language ID. Uh, I chose BF for obvious reasons. Attach a uh, input and output to that. If you don't do that, it will by default uh, attach to standard in and standard out. But for the web application that we just saw, outputting to standard out wouldn't make sense. We wouldn't be able to see the output. So we attach, in this case, a byte array output stream as the new standard out, and now build me this context. And finally, given the context, evaluate this piece of source code. And because we have redirected standard out to a byte array output stream, we can later capture that and do something with the result. For example, show it on a web page. So, as I said, it's a three-step process. This isn't the hard part, actually. This is for the end user be, being able to, to run their own DSL inside a Java program, for example, a Spring Boot application. Now, as I said, um, tooling is very important when you are a language designer. And one of the things that uh, GraalVM also gives you is tooling support. Now, what do we need to think of? Well, the, the, the most powerful example to me is the fact that you get a debugger for free. 
If you uh, have a program that uh, runs your, your guest language, your DSL, you can add the uh, hyphen hyphen inspect when you start it, and it will give you a debugger. The debugger uh, listens on a specific port, and it will print to standard out, go to this address in Chrome, and see what happens. What you get is this. This is just the, uh, the, the Chrome debugger. We all know that, I think. Um, note that uh, for this demo, I have launched the program with a little bit smaller memory size, because it turns out that Chrome doesn't really like 30,001 local variables. It starts bogging around. It says, give me a few seconds. Oh, yes, these are the 30,000 zeros that you had, which is not cool, of course. Um, so I said to my launcher, I want to have a smaller memory size. And what we see here is that we can uh, look at our own source code, uh, the annotated version this time. We can inspect our memory and see that all, value, uh, all locations in the, in the memory are initialized to zero. And we can just tap through the code, like it was JavaScript or something, what, what, uh, what you might usually debug in Chrome. And you can even add breakpoints. I've wa I have one there. And just say, OK, let's just resume until the next breakpoint. Um, uh, that's cool. This is especially cool because I didn't write any code for this. I just annotated some plain old Java objects and said, well, this is a, a kind of node where you could halt execution for your debugger. Again, just annotating your abstract syntax tree instead of having to write all of this yourself. Ah, yes, this is where you can stop. No, no, you can't stop there. This is not, not, not a piece in your AST where you can actually uh, halt execution. And we can inspect our stack again. We can see that the calculation was already done. Uh, so the, the memory cell has value 7. And then the only thing we need to do is we need to add, I think, 48 or something to, <coughs> to have the right ASCII value so that we could print to standard out. Because if we would print the byte 7 to standard out, it would not be the number 7 in ASCII. So the last piece of the program is just uh, uh, adding, I think, 48 bytes or so. Uh, the, the, for, 48 to the 7, so that we will have the number 7. And my program is run um, completely. There's no, uh, break, uh, there's no point left where the debugger can halt. Uh, the program terminates, uh, and my debugger says, OK, connection is lost. And as I said, this was almost no effort to get this working. It, it was there. It was there in the platform, and I could just use it. That's pretty cool. We saw that already. Uh, this, this works with the instrument API, which also comes with Truffle. And the instrument API gives you basically um, four things you can attach to. You can attach to source code being loaded, slash parsed. You can attach to uh, memory allocations. We have a very simple memory model here with just a byte of arrays, but imagine you have a complex memory model with, with stacks and heaps and stuff. You, you could have an instrument like a debugger or profiler or whatsoever attached to those memory-related events. We can attach to things like, hey, the, the runtime starts execution or starts a new thread or whatsoever. And finally, and that's what the debugger does, you can attach to application execution. The fact that we are currently running a specific node in our AST. The only tool that comes out of the box is a debugger that we just saw. But with the instrument API, you could write other tools yourself, profilers or code coverage uh, uh, tools that measure which part of the code was covered by, by tests. They don't ship with Growl itself, but you could write them. I didn't do that myself, by the way. It's about time for the wrap-up. Um, when I heard, first heard about GraalVM, I was like, OK, it's cool. You can run JavaScript and Ruby. But can you run any language with, with, with GraalVM? The working title for this talk was also, can you run any language with GraalVM? Which is very boring, of course, because, well, posing the question is basically answering it. Yes, you can. You can do that. But important remark, it may take some time to get there. It's not per se trivial, but it's time consuming. It is fun, by the way, and you learn a lot about things that you might never have known about before. 
especially if you didn't have a degree in, say, compilers or, or parsers or something like that. You learn a lot of new stuff. Um, it could be profitable. I don't think I'll earn any money with this BrainFuck implementation of mine. That's a disappointment for me, but I have to deal with that. But I've heard stories about a, a large bank in the United States which had their own language for decades with poor tools and poor, pro, uh, poor platform to run it on, and they're considering to re-implement the language on top of GraphVM. And then it might become profitable in the sense that they have a better platform to run their, uh, their own in-house developed programs on. That's a bit far-fetched maybe for us, but it could be relevant. Or if you indeed make a money out of shipping calls with your goat and your uh, wolf, it might be profitable too. If you want to go down this path, this is what you should take away when it comes to me. Uh, first, um, don't try to build a parser yourself. Could be fun, of course, but it, it, typically it's very hard. And you can have nasty bugs if you don't do it correctly. But second, maybe even more important, uh, take some time for yourself to think about what the AST should look like. Because the abstract syntax tree, that's, that's how your program execution flows, right? It's very important to correct program execution. If you do this wrong, and in the first iteration I did, my AST was, uh, was, was flawed, there was a design error in it, you'll have very hard to track bugs. They're hard to track because if you have another implementation of the language, and there's many uh, BrainFuck implementations out on the internet, they'll all say that your program is correct, but your implementation says it's not correct. It does something that you don't expect. Now, the program is, the source code doesn't contain the bug because other implementations run correctly. Now, where is the problem? Is my parsing uh, mistaken? Is my AST mistaken? It's very hard to, to, to track down these problems. And I even wrote a small tool to visualize my abstract syntax tree to dump it into a file that could be visualized like a PNG file, just to be able to inspect, like, where is it going wrong? What, what is it actually trying to do? And the second reason why it's important to uh, take care of a good AST design is that if you want to refactor, and I had to do that, that's pretty hard. Because, well, it finally compiles and it works for some kind of programs, but not for all of them. Um, refactoring that is not easy. And, and it, it's, it's well, yeah, okay, now this part works, but now that part is broken again. And I just had that working. So doing this upfront is maybe not the most interesting part, but it does pay off in the long run. That's all I had for today. I hope it was useful or at least inspiring. If you have any questions, we have plenty of time left for that. So feel free, shout out. By the way, you can find the implementation that I did if you want to go down this path on GitHub. Uh, the link is there, but I see many of you already taking pictures. Excellent. Uh, so you can, well, get inspired or get surprised, whatever you want, like. Questions, please. The question is, um, are you able to have it uh, compiled to native machine code? Uh, and uh, the short answer is yes, but that's boring. Um, by default, it doesn't compile to native, um, of course. It's just running inside the JVM. But the, the small command line utility that I wrote that just takes a BF file and runs it, well, you can use the native image tool to convert that to uh, a native executable. If I remember correctly, it's about 20 megabytes in size once it's done, so it's not particularly small, especially not given the fact that if you look up the Wikipedia page for this language, it says, well, each of those eight commands literally translates into one line of C code. Well, imagine that you <laughs> would follow that path. Your executable would probably be a few kilobytes or something. And this executable was 20 megabytes. So it's not small, but it runs, and it runs fast. But, and yes, you can. But for example, the Spring Boot application will probably not be able to compile to a native image. Why not? Because Spring Boot is not, not there yet. Does that answer the question? Excellent. The 
Questions, can you provide additional information to the debugger? Um, well, uh, to some extent you need to, because you need to tell the debugger this part of the AST uh, corresponds to this line and this column in source code. Otherwise, the debugger wouldn't be able to highlight this is where you currently reside in your source code. Um, the current pointer in memory where I'm looking at is just one variable. Uh, let me see, I had a screenshot of that. Let's see if I can, there it is. I just mentioned it's the underscore underscore data pointer, which is just another variable saying I'm currently looking at the first slot in memory and as soon as I do uh, move pointer left or right, this variable down there gets uh, changed. And that's basically because um, uh, BrainFuck itself um, needs that pointer to, to be there. It's not needed for the debugger per se. Does that answer the question? Great. <clears throat> Any other questions left? Yes, one. Yeah. Is the, the question is, is the opposite possible? Can you run uh, Java code from BrainFuck? Oh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, Wow, uh, I haven't thought of that yet, actually. I would say that it probably is possible, maybe if you do some magic with standard out, that you could spawn a new process which invokes the, the, the JVM, but it, not, 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 not in an embedded way. Uh, to, to be clear, it, it, it would be embedded in the, in the, in the BrainFuck uh, language, because the language doesn't have a construct for that. Yeah, exactly. If your language would accommodate for that, for example, it would, would have a construct that says, here, execute this literal Java code, then yes, of course you can, because you could just, uh, when building the AST, say, well, this is a special type of node. This is a node that runs literal Java code. But this particular language, or DSL, if you wish, uh, doesn't have such a command, which means there's no way to get back. Is that an answer to your question? I'm afraid it's only partial, but we'll have to stick with that. So if there's no questions left, I hope you enjoy your lunch, you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>